Hello, welcome back to the channel. Hope everyone is doing all right. Thank you as always for tuning in. So today we're gonna to talk about Fleetwood Mac. Now, when anyone mentions Fleetwood Mac, um, regardless of being a diehard music fan or whatever, or vinyl collector, I think most people will immediately think of this absolute juggernaut of a record. Here's of course rumors from 1977. Uh, hugely popular, a, an enormous seller, millions of copies, and still sells in massive quantities to this day. Any dealer or shop owner will tell you that if this is in the racks, it doesn't last for long. Uh, some key tracks still played on the radio, played to death, if I'm honest with you, on mainstream radio. Dreams, Don't Stop, Go Your Own Way, heard all the time. From this era, this is the band. This is, of course, from the Buckingham mix era. Um, and also, I think the other kind of popular era and album from them is Tango in the Night. Now, I haven't got a vinyl copy of that. I do know it very well. It is a um, firm favourite of my wife's, actually. But the track on that everywhere is played it literally everywhere, as the title is. Um, and I do think Fleet with Fleetwood Mac, that is kind of, you know, they are the key tracks that people know. However, um, some of the more purists or discerning listeners, if that is the right word, would argue that the proper fleet of Mac, the original fleet of Mac, is of course this era. Um, it is of course late 60s, what is known as the Peter Green era, the blues era. This is when fleet of Mac were. Uh, the leaders of the um, late 60s blues boom. It's an era that really didn't last long at all, to be honest with you, but it was enormously successful, enormously successful. Hit singles, number one with Albatross, and again, very, very popular, although it certainly doesn't get the radio airplay that the uh, that rumours and tango on the night do. However... You've got these two very, very distinct periods. And, I mean, to be fair, despite the fact that there's only two leading players in the band, Mick Fleetwood and John McVie, who have been a mainstay all the way through the rhythm section, um, it's there is a period in between that's largely forgotten about. And um, for many, many years, even before, long before I started making videos or even watching videos on here on YouTube, it was something that I argued about, that there is a period of Fleetwood Mac that is just not talked about. Criminally overlooked, if you want. I will say the term, criminally overlooked. Um, yet is incredibly good. Incredibly good. So, basically, we have got the last Peter Green era album, which is called Them Play On. And the first Buckingham Knicks era record, self-titled, just called Fleet with Mac, otherwise known as the White Album. How do we get from this to this? So strap yourselves in, people, because I'm going to go through what I call the wilderness years, um, the uh, unsung heroes of early 70s Fleet with Mac. So it's 1970, and... Front man, founder of the band, Peter Green, has left. Um, it's been widely talked about why, um, why he departed. Um, sometimes there's conflicting information, to be honest with you. Some, um, I think it, a lot of it is attributed to a bad acid trip in Munich. Others would argue that it is the trappings of uh, success and the wealth that came with it. It was probably, if truth be told, a combination of the two. Anyway, that is... Um, I won't go too much into that subject. So the band were left in an unfortunate position that they lost their main um, creative force. Uh, I think fortunate position for them is that they did, they had three guitarists and singers. So minus one equals you've still got two guitarists and singers. And of course, the rhythm section of McVlee and Fleetwood. So the band decamped to the countryside in 1970 and uh, made an album. And this is the first post-Peter Green record. And this one is called Kiln House. Okay, this particular copy is a nice German original. Comes with a nice booklet. 
Simon. And there we are, the band members there. So, so have you ever seen a stoned, more stoned looking like in all your life? Goodness me. Anyway, I think at this stage it's been written about that the band, you know, for obvious reasons, lacked a bit of confidence. Uh, this is not a bad record at all. It's not, it really isn't bad. You've got two distinct sounds on this one. You've got the kind of 50s throwback, is that the right word, or pastiche tracks that Jeremy Spencer was into. He was very much a kind of blues purist. Um, he, I don't think he was as keen on the way the band was, uh, the direction the band was heading because they were sort of, you know, going into sort of other more experimental directions as most blues bands do. And then you've got the writing of Danny Kerwin, which is very, very different. I think Danny Kerwin's kind of writing style is much more of a singer-songwriter. It's dreamy, kind of folky, almost ethereal in a way. And um, yeah, it's very much a game of two halves, this record. It is pretty good. It's not bad. It's not groundbreaking. I think the fact that you've got two very, very distinct styles kind of it creates not much of a great flow, if I'm honest with you. But it's still got some good moments on it. It's not bad at all. Now, at this stage, um, Christine McVie, who was, uh, of course, the, you know, the late, great Christine McVie, who was a long-standing member in Fleetwood Mac, had already had a solo record. She'd been in um, Savoy Brown. No, that's wrong. What am I talking about? She wasn't in Savoy Brown at all. Excuse me. She was in Chicken Shack. Sorry about that. She'd been in Chicken Shack. Uh, she'd left... Um, got together with John McVie, married him, and was kind of, you know, part of the group's entourage. And she did play on a couple of these tracks, although uncredited. But one thing she is credited with is she drew that amazingly good cover. Look at that. I absolutely love that. That is a, that is a brilliant sleeve. Um, the band planned to go on tour and then basically asked her to join as a full-time member. So she, at this stage, yeah, she went on tour with them. So she hadn't written anything for the band, but was a touring member and uh, remained with them for many, many years, as many of you will probably know. So, um, stroke of bad luck, they went on tour. Uh, they were touring America. I believe they were in Los Angeles. Uh, guitarist Jeremy Spencer decides to pop out. Um, I think he popped out. I've, I've heard conflicting info on what he popped out for. I've read magazine, groceries. I don't know what. But he went. He, he decided to go to a shop. And uh, he went missing. Couldn't be found for days. And uh, when he was found, eventually, it turns out he was um, approached by a religious cult called the Children of God. Uh, joined them and subsequently left the band without any notice. And, yeah, it's it's a crazy story, what happens to these guitarists in Fleetwood Mac. So, uh, yeah, dates were cancelled, and they were left in the lurch, um, minus one guitarist. Um, at this stage, to complete certain dates, um, for what I understand, Peter Green did briefly return. Um, the gigs they were playing were huge long affairs featuring sort of hour-long jam sessions of some of their earlier hits. Must have been quite a spectacle to go and see. But in the meantime, they were um, tasked to get a replacement guitar player and a, and a songwriter. And they went with um, American guitarist Bob Welch, who was living in America at the time and uh, flew over to join them uh, immediately past the audition. So we've now got um, the lineup of Danny Kerwin, Bob Welch, Christine McVie, and the rhythm section, which I've mentioned before. Uh, the first album they came up with is a brilliant one. This is absolutely fantastic from 1971. It's called Future Games. And this, to me, is what we're talking about with the unsung kind of heroes of the Fleetwood Mac documentary. This is a truly, truly superb record, but one I do not hear talked about at all. And it was only not a bad seller, but a moderate, you know, it's only going to be a moderate seller at best. 
So continuing kind of Danny Kerwin style, we've got his real kind of lovely, folky, singer-songwriter style, ethereal, dreamy. It's beautiful. His guitar playing has, has, you know, the phrasing and the tone of his guitar playing is wonderful and his vocals really suit the songs he writes. Uh, Christine McVie is now writing. Her style, I don't really think has changed over the years. I think her songwriting improved. Certainly her, her better songs came later on, I think, towards when she, um, you know, when she was in the Buckingham Knicks era. But um, she found her feet really quickly and she, her songs are always very upbeat. They're ballads. She's got a very distinctive vocal style. And we've got two of her tracks on here. And also two tracks from newly appointed Bob Welch, who also compliments it. I find his his kind of style quite sort of dreamy and ethereal. He's got quite a sort of soft vocal style. This is a fantastic record. It's almost kind of a little bit psychedelic in places, even a little bit proggy. There is even a little bit of prog rock going on. There are some lengthy tracks on this one, but it's not too proggy. It is a wonderful, wonderful rock album and I would urge anyone who likes Fleetwood Mac and hasn't heard it or just likes good music from the 70s to check this out. Prices do seem to be going up. I think it does depend on what issue you get. This is a UK pressing. I paid £5 for this years ago. Um, the shop I used to go to just got hold of it for me because I kept going on. But um, yeah, fantastic. Now, quick mention needs to go to this record, Fleetwood Mac's Greatest Hits, which was released around this time. Um, this is, um, most of it is the Peter Green era, so it really is out of this timeline, but it does include one single, which was released from the era that I'm discussing here, called Dragonfly. Fantastic track, flopped as a single, didn't do anything at all, didn't chart. I don't think I've ever seen a copy on, on 7 Inch, but it's a wonderful track. I mean, this is a wonderful compilation anyway, because um, more than half of it is non-album singles, so it's absolutely essential. But um, there is a some great footage of this lineup playing Dragonfly in Germany on a TV show called Beat Club, and, and the quality of the footage is stunning. If I remember, I will try and leave a link in the description when I get to edit this video. So, without a lineup change, the band's soldiering on, not doing too badly. At this stage, they were, they were touring, but they were often a support band. I've seen bills where they were um, supporting bands like Deep Purple. They were kind of second on the bill which is remarkable considering how successful they've been about two, three, four years before in the late 60s. But more fame and success was, of course, to come. So they decamped to um, the countryside in Hampshire. I don't know where in Hampshire. I don't know if it was anywhere near here in Portsmouth. But, yeah, I'm not too sure. If you know, put it in the comments. But, yeah, their next record, Bear Trees, wonderful. I, th I actually think the cover kind of gives the kind of it's it's actually quite fitting to the music here. It is kind of some of it is quite stark, but this again, like Future Days, is a wonderful record. It's absolutely brilliant. It's often known as Danny's album because he dominates most of it. I find this one a little bit heavier than Future Games. There's still the kind of ethereal sound but it is a bit more kind of rock and roll riff heavy no less good it's wonderful the opening track child of mine wonderful sentimental lady by bob welch he was to later have success with that on a solo record but the version on this is absolutely wonderful christine mcvee's uh two tracks i wouldn't say the strongest ones she's ever done but they're all right but Again, a great, great record. Not the easiest one to find. Not the biggest seller in the world. This is a UK first pressing on reprise. So, guitarists and their problems. Um, on tour, Danny Kerwin, who, as I understand, was uh, quite a big drinker, had a bit of a breakdown at one of the gigs um, his behaviour was kind of temperamental and erratic. 
But at a gig, he decided to have a tantrum, smash the hotel room up, including uh, one of his prized guitars, and uh, essentially left the band. He didn't. He, um, the band went on stage without him, and uh, he then decided at the end of the gig to criticise what they'd done. So he was kicked out, which is a real shame. What is going on with the guitarist of Fleetwood Mac? What is it all about? So another lineup change. This time they recruited guitarist Bob Weston. Uh, Bob Weston was neither a writer or a singer. He is. He has kind of got a co-credit on one or two tracks coming up, but um, he wasn't a front man. This was um, the songwriting we here was left down to Christine McVie and Bob Welch. Um, they also recruited a singer called Dave Walker, who had been in Savoy Brown, uh, the early seventies incarnations of Savoy Brown. Um, and we ended up with this record called Penguin. Uh, this is not one of their strongest efforts at all. Um, I personally think, actually, it's not a personal thought at all. No, this is actually fact. Reading online reviews from people, it's generally considered one of their worst. I think the level of the songwriting on this record just wasn't up to scratch as the previous two. It's as simple as that. It has its moments. It really does. It does have its moments, but it's just not that great. Um, one thing that does kind of stand out, there we are, there's the band in full glory there. The singer they got in called Dave Walker, who I just mentioned, his vocal style did not fit in at all. He was a kind of gruff, hard rocking kind of singer. Um, and he only actually sings on two tracks. I don't know how long he lasts in the band. I can't really find much information on his time with the band. But as I understand, he was not in it for long and was kicked out. Um, just one of those things. Yeah, one of those strange things, really. Um, yeah, he was a bit unlucky, Dave Walker, because he later joined Black Sabbath in 1976 as Ozzy Osbourne's uh, replacement and did start recording with them until Ozzy Osbourne decided to briefly come back and he was kicked out of Black Sabbath. So, yeah, most unlucky for him. But it's an OK album. There's some lovely guitar work from Bob Weston. He's a really great, great guitar player. He's so skilled, got such a unique style, and he really, really does add something to the band so uh, it's all right not too bad at all okay so soldiering on another lineup change although this is only minus dave walker who, as i mentioned really just did not see we got this album from 1973 called mystery to me this record is fabulous it is fabulous from this era that i'm discussing here for me, personally, this is my favourite record. And to be honest with you, this is my favourite Fleetwood Mac record that I heard and own. I, this is absolutely fantastic and is not too difficult to obtain. Really is good. All that I can say here is I just think it, it is nothing really more than a, just a fantastic collection of songs, a bit like Rumours is or was. You know, you, it's not, considering what was going on in the early 70s, concept albums, Fleetwood Mac weren't really about that. They, they, were, they were about the songwriting and creating great, great songs, and that's what you've got here, 12 brilliant tracks that... Um, Christine McVie, some of her greatest songs on, are on here. Believe Me, Just Crazy Love, Why, fantastic tracks. Bob Welch, um, Emerald Eyes, opening track, brilliant. And my favourite Pink, um, my favourite Fleetwood Mac track of all is track four, Hypnotised. It is a fantastic song. It's hypnotic. Very apt. I would urge anyone who hasn't heard this record to try and listen to it get it on vinyl it's not that pricey or difficult to obtain get it on cd or stream if you need to do it but there we go there is the band at that stage in full flight so guess what there was another problem with a guitarist the guitarist bob weston who was doing rather well and adding, as I say, lovely flourishes to this band. Um, 
decided to have an affair with Mick Fleetwood's wife. It's interesting about this band because um, if you know the history of Fleetwood Mac, if you're familiar with it, um, the band had personal and marital problems whilst recording rumours. It's been talked about and, you know, that it was absolutely dreadful. So they were already starting up at this stage. Bob, uh, Bob Weston had an affair with Jenny Fleetwood and uh, was very quickly and quite rightly kicked out of the band. So, yeah, another blow. Bad luck. What is going on with them? Now, at this stage, uh, as they weren't doing as well as they wanted to in the UK, they uh, fleet were back moved to the States. Um, they didn't recruit rec uh, a replacement guitarist. It was the first and only time in their career where they had just one guitarist, Bob Welch, remaining. And uh, whilst in the States, they produced this record. This is 1974, Heroes Are Hard To Find. All sorts of bad things were really going on. At this stage, and all around this time, there was a bogus Fleetwood Mac touring on the road, which um, they had to put a stop to. That involved a load of uh, legal stuff. That's another story in itself. Um, but, uh, yeah, this record here, I have to admit, I wasn't very familiar with it. I've owned it for years, and I haven't played it for years. I spun it last week, because for the per really, for the purposes of, of this video, to actually um, see what I thought. To be honest with you, I don't think it's a strong effort at all, if I'm honest. Bob Welch dominates this one, but listening to it, a lot of the ideas sound kind of, I just, it sounds actually quite unfinished. It almost sounds like it's got the kind of Hollywood production, sort of American production that later albums would have. But the ideas and the songwriting that we've had on the previous albums, Mystery to Me, Future Games, Bear Trees, they're just not there at all. You know, it had its moments, but... Mm, I can kind of see why I bought it and probably didn't play it very much. There we go. That's just, that's just my personal opinion, of course. The cover is actually quite reminiscent of the self-titled Fleetwood Mac and Rumours. It's certainly in that kind of weird style. Mick Fleetwood there, although I, I don't think you would get away with that today. I mean, that's, yeah, no. For obvious reasons, I don't think that would happen. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? So that's, there we are. That is the final record in this mid 70s, sorry, early 70s incarnation. By this time, Bob Welch was completely disheartened by the band. He'd had enough. Maybe that's the reason, his, maybe his heart wasn't in on this record. Maybe that's the reason it just didn't sound as good as some of the early ones. Um, while they were recording, um, or at least recording or present in the United States, um, an engineer or producer showed, um, you know, showing a studio set up, I believe, or something like that, showed Mick Fleetwood um, an album by Buckingham Nicks. Um, I must confess, I don't own this album and I've never heard it, but if I see it, I do need to pick it up. I've had opportunities before and wish I had. Um, Mick Fleetwood was bowled over by what he heard, particularly the guitarist. He wanted the guitarist. Um, the guitarist insisted that um, if he joined, that his partner Stevie Nicks, vocalist Stevie Nicks, joined. And the rest, as they say, is history. And that's it. Mega stardom, worldwide fame, and uh, one of the most popular bands in musical history. I think you'll agree. And there we are. That's it. So to sum up... Um, it is of my personal opinion <laughs> that this era of Fleetwood Mac is the most interesting one. Um, this video was born out of frustration at the end of the day. Real, real frustration because the um, Fleetwood Mac quite rightly have their reputation anchored in the Buckingham Knicks era and the Peter Green era. Quite right. It's quality. I like it. But when you've got so much quality stuff that I've, like I've just shown here, 
it's just such a shame that it's unrecognised. It really is. Um, I read a biography um, a few years ago. It's actually written by um, Bob Brunning, who was the original bass player in Fleetwood Mac. And um, it's a good biography. It was written in the late 90s, I think. And um, I was just amazed how the, how five years of Fleetwood Mac were only re- represented in a single chapter of the whole biography. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. I really, really, really couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, unbelievable. Um, guitarist Bob Welch, who was such a key figure in Fleetwood Mac, when they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I think is a bollocks concept anyway. I, I really do. I can't stand it, but I'm going to mention it. He His name was not included. His name, and it, it, that is an absolute travesty. It really is. But there we go. Um yeah, fate did not fate did not deal uh, a good hand to the guitarist of Fleet with Mac Peter Green problems. Although he did bounce back, Jeremy Spencer religious cult. Obviously, we, it was his choice at the end of the day, and I think he is you know he is back playing and touring a little bit now. Danny Kerwin never really recovered from mental illness. Yeah, he was yeah such a shame. Bob Welch who did have some problems. Um, was fine for years, and then as a result of um, a painful back condition, which he couldn't recover from, um, tragically took his own life. Awful, absolutely awful. And, of course, Lindsay Buckingham, who joined later on in years, was not without his personal demons either. It is the curse of the guitar player. So there we go. Anyway, I think that's all I've got to say. Um, Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Always a pleasure. Please check these records out if you can, if you haven't already. Um, If you think that this video was absolutely pointless and that these (laughs) albums are, in fact, very well known and you love them, do let me know in the comments. It's always good to hear from you. So until the next time, take care and thank you very much for watching.